Hey everybody, welcome to episode 63 of the Go Get Outside podcast. This is your host, Jason Milligan. Welcome back. Welcome aboard. I am finally past all of my winter sicknesses. I can speak normally again and I am done with all the travel I had to do this month. So now it is time to get back to life as usual and this podcast. Our guest on today's show is a nice follow up from our previous episode, which was all about bike packing and bike touring. Well, we will continue with that topic. Today we will be speaking with Olivia Round. She is a cyclist bicycle advocate, author, and she has traveled 5,000 miles across the United States on a bicycle by herself, hoping to confront her deep-seated fear of men and sexual assault. So this is a bit of a departure from some of the previous episodes. We'll be speaking a lot about bike touring, but we will also be speaking about the psychological repercussions of those fearful elements of our human society. So as I mentioned earlier, I was sick through much of December when this was recorded, so if my voice sounds particularly nasty, that's what it is. Despite that, you're in for a good episode, so I'll stop rambling and we can head off and speak to Olivia Round. My name is Olivia Round, and I grew up in Ketchikan, Alaska. I loved riding bicycles even as a little kid, and when I got to college in Forest Grove, Oregon, I fell more deeply in love with bicycles and decided to do a cross-country bike tour from Oregon to Florida when I was 21. And I've done a, a few bicycle tours since then, but that was definitely the most transformative trip of my life, and it was the best thing I've ever done. I am now a cyclist and a bicycle bicycle advocate, particularly for women, to ride bicycles more in their daily lives and also to entertain the idea of taking a more intrepid adventure by bicycle. I currently live with my boyfriend on Whidbey Island, just north of Seattle, and I ride my bike every day. I also have a website called oliviaround.com where you can read interviews with female cyclists of all walks of life. There's daily commuters, there's hardcore athletes, there's a lot of adventurous bike tourers and that kind of thing. Um, You can also read excerpts from my upcoming book, Miss America, How I Got Over My Fear of Boys by Biking Across the Country, which is a memoir that I'm writing about my cross-country solo bike tour, and it's a lot of fun, and it's very candid, (laughs) so it's definitely a book for adults, but it's a really good story and one that I think the world needs right now about a young woman overcoming fear of her own country and of herself and her fellow people to do adventurous things. I know you just said you live in Washington now, but as you told me before, you just moved from Hawaii. So you grew up in Alaska and you've lived in Hawaii, which were the two U.S. states that I think the other 48 states forget about. And who also... (laughs) Yes, I would say that's true. (laughs) (laughs) And and they're also the most removed physically and time-wise from the rest of the country. So I think one thing about having grown up in Alaska that people probably find interesting is daylight. You lived somewhere where daylight either came in abundance or you had far few hours of it. So after having moved away from there, did you have the opposite problem most people have, which is adapting to daylight coming to you almost in equal parts instead of in seasons? Yeah, I loved living in Hawaii for an entire year. It was such a treat because I've always been so drawn to really warm, hot weather and tropical environments, probably because it's just so different from where I grew up. 
And living in Hawaii was good because my boyfriend and I both agreed it's an amazing place to vacation and we will always love visiting there. But living there is really different. And the tropical heat, I got to say it kind of got to me at one point. We lived in a small cramped apartment with a couple other people and we didn't have any air conditioning. And it was so oppressively hot that you couldn't really stay in the apartment. But going outside was really intense too because the heat and the sun and the UV rays just felt like they were baking your brain. So you felt like you were either being roasted in the oven or fried on a grill and you couldn't really find any peace except going to the beach, which wasn't always an option. Sometimes we had to get work done or stay at home. The Hawaii Tourism Board is getting ready to contact you right now. (laughs) The, The oppressive heat of a grill or an oven. Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. You get to, that was the summertime. We lived in Hilo, so it was pretty wet. And oh, yeah, yeah. It rains a lot there, which it rains a lot in my hometown, too. They both have average rainfall of over 150 inches a year. So it's just one wet island to another. <laughs> yeah, so if, if you moved to Hawaii and you said that you've always kind of been a person that prefers that tropical weather, you didn't get that in Alaska. So what did that look like while you were growing up? So I grew up in Ketchikan, which is a pretty small town. It's the biggest town for hundreds of miles, but it's small. It's about 13,000 people, and it's on an island with no road access. So you have to take a boat or a plane in order to visit. It's one of the top cruise ship destinations in the state, so we get a lot of tourism in the summer. But then as soon as October rolls around, the ocean gets pretty rough. It gets really wet and dark and miserable, (laughs) and so the tourists stop coming, and the local scene really picks up. Because it's such a dreary outer world, the citizens of Southeast Alaska have a really vibrant arts culture. We're obsessed with basketball. Basketball was by far (laughs) the biggest sport. I couldn't figure out why football was so popular until I moved to Oregon for college and realized that it's a more pleasant outdoor environment. (laughs) We liked basketball because... (laughs) It was warm and well lit and indoors, and that was good for us. Don't worry, I can't. I can't figure out why any of them are so popular. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I grew up in a really vibrant arts community. I was trained by some amazing artists. I did all kinds of sculpture and painting, and I was a dancer my whole childhood. And I just loved moving and making the world colorful. So that was how I coped with living in a really dreary place. The people were very vibrant for sure, and I love going and frolicking in the forest and ocean. But yeah, I I do struggle with, you know, a little bit of that seasonal affective disorder. If it's gray and dreary for months on end, the way it was in Ketchikan, I have a hard time. I feel I feel sad. So it's good to take your vitamin D and eat fish or somehow get your omega threes and get some sunshine every now and then. Well at least now you live in the sunny, less dreary Seattle area. (laughs) <laughs> you know, Whidbey Island is luckily in the rain shadow. We have good weather when Seattle's oh. hurting, so I'm grateful for that. Oh, so maybe you've finally chosen a place with with a moderate type of weather instead of either oppressive heat or oppressive uh, cold and, and dreariness? <laughs> yeah, I think we're in the right spot for right now, for sure. So at what point did you get interested in bicycles? Because you said you grew up in Alaska and you spent a lot of time dancing and doing arts and going out into the woods. But at some point you decided to get on a bike. So what drew that? My love affair with bikes was exceedingly practical at first. I was probably six years old and needed to get to my friend's house. And we got bicycles for Christmas I can't remember how old I was when we got bikes. It might have been a few years later, seven or eight years old. And I just loved that I could get to her house so quickly without needing to walk there with my short little legs. And so we quickly formed a biker gang in my neighborhood, and we loved riding our bikes around everywhere and getting into trouble, going down to the beach and going to neighbors' houses to get candy. It was a really positive experience with bikes. We didn't know how anything worked. I just remember those bicycles were so heavy and so difficult to pedal. But I watched my mom ride her bike. She was one of very few adults, I should say, who rode bicycles in Ketchikan. My mom was my first bicycling hero. She would ride her bike eight miles to town and back, and people thought she was just insane. Nobody was doing that in Ketchikan, Alaska at that time. She was a bit of a local celebrity, You know, she was like, oh, your mom's that lady that rides her bike to town. She had a little trailer that she would put me and my brother in and tow us. 
so she could get exercise while we took naps or enjoyed the scenery when we were really little. And then when we were old enough, sometimes she would ride her bike with us, but usually it was something she did alone because she liked going at a pace that we couldn't keep up with. So I watched my mom do these very seemingly at the time, they seemed really long distance. And so I was like, wow, you know, your bike can take you wherever you want to go. But that didn't really hit me until I got to college because there's something about being on the mainland and looking down the road and realizing that road can take you all the way to Florida. When you grew up on an island with 40 miles of road, you look at the road and it doesn't have that sense of mystery or promise. Like you know where it's going and that it's going to end and then it's a wilderness full of eagles and bears and deer. But moving to the mainland was really eye-opening because your bike can take you all the way to Chile and Patagonia if you've got two years and a lot of bravery. <laughs> and so... Is that a hint for your next trip? No, no. <laughs> I can't say I'm all that attracted to really long trips anymore. It was a time in my life when I really needed that, but now I, I like having the shorter trips. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what inspired you to embark on your long trip and what what the reasons were behind that. So there were a lot of reasons for me to decide to ride my bicycle across the country. And I'll get to the most honest one eventually. (laughs) Some of the more superficial reasons were that I hadn't seen my sister in a long time and she lived in Florida. There weren't a lot of classes being offered that fall semester that I needed to take. And I realized I could still graduate on time if I only attended spring semester. So I had this whole fall semester open for some kind of adventure. And I love having adventures. I had already taken one semester off of college when I was a sophomore to go by myself to Chile. So I was really excited at the prospect of taking another break from college. I want to say I was rebellious. But I don't want anyone to think I was that hardcore or (laughs) particularly useful as an activist. (laughs) I just really didn't like cooperating fully with authority at that point in my life. And so taking breaks from college really helped me feel like I was sticking it to the man. I really enjoyed that, you know, there was this prescribed path that you need to attend college for four years and then come out of it and get a decent job. And I decided I was not going to do that. I was going to take breaks from college and I was going to have a ton of fun and and still graduate on time, which I did. So you were rebellious because you wanted to take a life path that was (laughs) of your own design instead of the design of everyone else. Yeah. (laughs) I just want to point out that that is a rebellious idea, which is sort of sad. (laughs) (laughs) So I also loved bicycles. I've always loved traveling. My family's incredibly adventurous. But the real reason that I decided to ride my bicycle across the country is because I was deeply afraid of men. And this was a fear that I'd harbored since I was a little, little kid. I honestly have no memories of a time when I wasn't afraid of men. There's no particular event or instance where suddenly little child Olivia's mind decided that men were scary. I think it was just growing up in a culture, and maybe it's a little bit of a reflection on Alaska. It's very much an intense place with really tough people. I was just a really sensitive kid. I felt really strong emotions. I still do. Were you encouraged to explore those emotions or was it the type of environment where people would say, suck it up and move on and bury that deeper inside yourself? Yeah, I think that's very insightful of you. That was definitely... The culture that I grew up with was definitely one where strong emotions were frowned upon and shut down and people were encouraged to suck it up and move on. And I had it a little bit better because I was a girl, but even women are incredibly tough in Alaska and it's a hard place to be a really sensitive, emotional kid. So when you're growing up and learning about the struggles that people face in this world and some of the ways that people hurt each other, I think that's hard for every kid growing up. And it was hard for me. But for some reason, rape and sexual violence were just really hard for me. I could not, for the life of me, figure out why anyone would want to do that to someone else. And because I didn't understand it, it terrified me because I felt like I lived in a world full of monsters that you couldn't pinpoint who they were. You know, that's what you get taught in health class. It could be anybody. And while that's a great way to teach stranger danger, it's a really awful view of the world. It really messes with your psyche to think that one in four young women are sexually assaulted before the age of 18 and we don't know who's going to do it. I mean, that's the worst epidemic in this nation. You know, that's worse than heart disease. That's worse than 
cancer. It's just awful that it's so indiscriminate and it could happen to anybody. And so I grew up just being so afraid of men, which is sad because they're half of the human population. And there were lots of wonderful men in my life. My dad is a great person. My brother was absolutely wonderful. And I wasn't afraid of them. They kind of didn't count because they, they were part of my family. But I turned down every slow dance all through middle school and high school. I never dated. I wore layers of clothing when I went to high school. I was just really nervous about being found attractive because I didn't know what to do with that. I tried being a lesbian. Part of me wished that that would work out because that would make my life a lot easier, but I was definitely attracted to men. So I had this conundrum where the people that I was most attracted to were also the people I most feared. And high school was a really confusing time. Like, was there any sort of prevalence for this sort of violence in your community? Or do you think it was more just the fact that you were hearing about the possibility of it that built up this kind of fear in the back of your head? I think it was the possibility of it. I didn't know very many people personally who had been sexually assaulted as I grew up. But there was a lot of stories in the news and I, yeah, it was something that I got a little bit stuck on. I got obsessed with it. It wasn't necessarily that my community was obsessed with it or that it was very prevalent, but for some reason it was something that just stuck in my brain and I chewed on it way too much. My theory is that I actually traumatized myself, that somehow by trying to empathize and understand sexual violence, I put myself in the victim's shoes a lot in my imagination, and I I actually traumatized myself. Like, I actually hurt myself psychologically. I didn't know any better at the time. I was just trying to make sense of it. But I think you can dwell on something too much without trying to really process it. You're just sort of wallowing in the torture of it. And so I actually have had to heal psychologically from an event that never happened, but that I was so worried it would happen, it actually hurt me. It's pretty bizarre being human. It's kind of an example of how there's also sometimes a bit of a danger in preparing people for dangers and that it can build up a sort of fear or phobia in this case that's unwarranted, not entirely unwarranted, but at the level and degree that it became a part of your life, it was unwarranted for that amount. That's interesting because this isn't a phobia that I think I've heard much about, but I bet there's a larger prevalence than we suspect. Yeah, I think the difficulty with it being a phobia is that when I told my mom Mom, I'm really afraid of men. She looked me in the eye and said, oh, good. (laughs) You know, and I know that she was coming from a good place. And my mom loves men and definitely was trying to get me to feel more comfortable with them. And she really encouraged me to go on dates and to feel beautiful. And she was really trying to help me get over my fear. But the underlying idea was that, oh, good, you know, be a little afraid of men. Be careful. So it's hard to pinpoint it as a phobia because the feedback you get is good. (laughs) When really people need to sit you down and say, hey, it's okay to assess your situation and trust your instinct and and try to keep yourself safe, but you don't need to go around in the world every day freaking out. Because it got so bad by the time I was in college that a man would walk towards me down the street and I would cross the street to walk on the other sidewalk so I wouldn't have to pass him. And this is in broad daylight in a really small college town. It got so ridiculous that I got so sick of being afraid all the time, I decided to go to Chile by myself when I was 20. So I had a boyfriend at that time, a really wonderful soul, and he was so supportive and so instrumental in my healing process. But I I had to be away from him because I had to feel my own strength and trust my own intuition and keep myself safe. So I went to Chile when I was 20 for three months, and that was amazing. And I came back and I was like, sweet, I am cured. I've stayed with strangers. I've gotten hitchhiking rides and people's pickups with strange men, and I wasn't afraid, and I'm cured. And then I came back to the United States and realized that I was only cured of my fear for small <laughs> men who were shorter than me with brown skin who spoke Spanish. So cured of that subpopulation, specific. but the rest of the male gender was still really scary to me. <laughs> that must have been an extremely trying experience to, first of all, decide that you were going to do that and then go through with it. Yeah, it was really scary for me. And that's something that might come up later in our interview, too, with the bicycle tour. The most common question I get asked is, were you afraid? And part of the reason why I'm writing my memoir is because I want people to understand that when 
and you live with fear every day, going on a big adventure with these sudden, very different fears is actually relieving because they distract you from this nagging fear that you've harbored your whole life. Attending classes at college and hanging out with friends and all these happy activities had this little specter of fear in them for me. And so to be out on the road with these new fears was nice. (laughs) It was refreshing. I think that's a really good point because even outside of what we're talking about right now, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And it's part of the reason that I think people getting into activities that can have a little bit of a risk or a little bit of a danger without being excessive can be so beneficial to people because they do shift their focus from worrying about the little things they worry about every day and then worrying about immediate consequences and learning to manage those and deal with those kind of prepares them for dealing with their other problems in their day-to-day life. One of my favorite sayings is, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. And that's one of the ways that professionals treat people with phobias is they introduce, you know, a really small amount of a phobia at a time until you get desensitized to it. So, you know, if you're afraid of spiders and you always avoid spiders in every single way, you're going to stay afraid of them. But if you start looking at pictures of them and then you start watching videos of them and soon one day you'll be able to be in the same room with a spider and not totally lose yourself. I was never diagnosed as having a phobia and I never did counseling or I went to a hypnotist one time but that's a wild story. Um, (laughs) I, I was just really nervous about seeking out professional help because I felt so frustrated that I didn't have a story of some specific event happening to me that I needed to heal from. I felt like that's where they'd want to start is okay what happened Olivia why are you afraid. And I just didn't want to start there. I wanted to go, I don't know, but I'm on a quest to feel better. And and I don't want to berate myself for not remembering or not having a specific story to heal from. I just want to start with where I am. And I want to introduce these fears into my life every day until I get desensitized. (laughs) It's really, really uncomfortable. It's not a pleasant experience, but the outcome is just life changing. I am just a better person for having done that trip and all the other adventures I've been on. Is that the thought that brought you to Chile? You specifically decided, okay, I want to confront this and this seems like a way to do it? Yeah, I actually remember the moment I decided I was... I was at college and I was procrastinating from doing my schoolwork. And so I decided to draw a pie chart of what I thought about every day. So I drew this circle and then there were slices of pie to represent, you know, how many hours I spent thinking about each thing. This is just, I don't know. I'm the daughter of an accountant. And maybe it shows sometimes. So I drew this no, circle. No, no. Everyone I, thinks pie charts are fun. Everyone thinks that. <laughs> pie charts. They're just a thrill. So I drew this circle and I had a great big slice of pie for thinking about my friends and another huge slice of pie for thinking about my boyfriend. And there was like a pretty sad slice of pie for thinking about school. Food took up a huge part of the pie chart. And when I was all done, there was this slice left that was small, but it was kind of significant. It would have represented about two hours a day. And I was like, what am I thinking about for two hours a day that I can't account for? And at first I thought, well, maybe I just got the math wrong. You know, maybe this is, it's going to be filled up by the other categories. And then all of a sudden it just hit me like bolt of lightning style that I spent in total about two hours a day being afraid of rape. So it'd be like five minutes here and 10 minutes there and 15 minutes here. And over the course of 24 hours, it would add up to two hours of worrying about the worst possible thing that could happen. And I was like, this has got to stop. This is so bad. (laughs) I don't want to spend two hours of my one wild and precious life worrying about things that may never happen. So it's time to do something drastic. And that's when I decided to go to Chile. And what did that trip look like? I was a woofer. I was a volunteer with the Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms program. So I worked on organic farms and then I hitchhiked solo for a couple weeks in Patagonia at the very end once I felt a little bit more comfortable with myself. I met the most amazing people. I got a little bit better at Spanish and Patagonia reminded me so much of my home in Alaska. It was really fun to see the Southern Hemisphere is like the Northern Hemisphere flipped on its head. As I got further South, it was like going further North in Alaska. And I actually got to stay the night in a small fishing village that I swear was the Ketchikan equivalent of Chile. It was really cool. So you you went there, you have this amazing experience. You think you've cured yourself. You come back find out you haven't and then where did <laughs> you go from there yet. 
<laughs> just partially <laughs> if, cured. If only it was that easy, right? If only. Yeah. It's still ongoing. I've gotten so much better, but it's a long journey to heal yourself from systemic fear. Don't worry. We're all trying to heal ourselves from some sort of fears all the time. <laughs> you are not yeah, alone in that pursuit. Absolutely. Even if it's just the fear of not being enough, I feel like that's probably the most common human fear. So when you realized that you still had more work to do, what did you decide to do next? So I realized I wasn't fully cured and I knew that I needed more solo adventure. I now realized that that was going to be my best medicine because it was so distracting and so shocking and the culture shock and just the fear of being alone and traveling rattled me so greatly that it could rattle me into new patterns and new ways of thinking. I also had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I really felt like I needed to prove myself, maybe not to the world, but just to myself. I wanted to be a very strong woman. I wanted to be a force to be reckoned with. I wanted independence. I wanted people to be a little scared of me. And if you've ever seen a photo of me, I'm just not scary. I'm, I'm just really, I'm, I'm really sweet. But I have this edge where I just really want people to know that I mean business. Looking back, I understand what that is. I understand that I had been so hurt by the presence of sexual violence in the world, just hurt that it existed. And I really wanted to take that hurt out on someone. And when I traveled alone, if someone treated me badly or said the wrong thing, I could glare at them and yell and just I could take out this rage I would have an outlet for it at last and I think secretly and this is a pretty big confession but I think secretly I wished that someone would try to hurt me so I could just kill him with my bare hands and finally have an outlet for all this pent-up rage and fear that had been in me for so long so I really wanted to travel alone and I know I sound super scary now and I'm okay with that it's the truth no 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 it, it's <laughs> there's a reason that the Jekyll and Hyde story was created and has evolved into the Incredible Hulk and everything else we all have these like separate sides and side of us. The bully always has the danger of becoming the bully and the mistreated always has the danger of then enacting violence against those who enact violence on them. So it's a very natural human instinct that I think you're coming to terms with. Yeah, absolutely. Solo adventures in the outdoors really give us an opportunity to explore who we are because the wilderness will hold you however you are. You know, you can come to the forest and be exactly yourself. You don't have to be polite or prepared or kind or worry about anyone else's feelings. And for me as a young woman, that was huge because I think it's difficult for a lot of young women to put themselves truly first and not worry about if they look good or if someone else is happy or if they should be making better conversation or just what people think. You don't have to worry about what people think when you're alone in the wilderness. And it's a really good place to go for therapy. <laughs> and I'm sure so many people have said that on your blog before, but it was the right place for me to go and heal from this for sure. If so many people say a certain thing a bunch of times, there's usually a pretty good reason behind that. Mm -hmm. So you have decided at some point that the new solution is to hop on a bike and travel across the continental United States. Yeah, bikes are one of the most vulnerable forms of travel. You know, you're a little bit more vulnerable on your own two feet. And there's been lots of people that have walked across the United States, but I was not attracted to that idea at all. I really wanted my bike to carry my gear for me. I did not want to wear a backpack. Bicycles are a little bit faster, obviously, than walking, but they have that same vulnerability in that you are exposed to the elements and you're exposed to your fellow people. You're not safe and closed in a moving vehicle. You're out there for everybody to see, for the rain to pound and the sun to shine on. And it's a very real sensory experience of travel. So what was the plan for your trip? You said you went from Oregon to Florida. So where'd you start? Where'd you stop? And how long were you giving yourself to do this? So I had the whole semester and I started on August 1st in Forest Grove, Oregon, and I used bicycle maps from a nonprofit organization called the Adventure Cycling Association. They make amazing bike route maps across the United States and they do lots of small trip routes as well. So I pieced together some of their maps to take me from Oregon through Idaho to Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, and Missouri. And then I turned south when I got to the Mississippi River and followed another bike route called the Mississippi River Trail, which was not as well 
mapped out by any means and was a lot more difficult and much less frequented by bicyclists, at least in the part that I did, which is the stretch through the deep south, Arkansas, Mississippi, all the way to New Orleans. And I was in New Orleans for Halloween, which was awesome. And then I went to Florida on another adventure cycling association route called the Southern Tier. So it ended up being a little bit over 5,000 miles from coast to coast. I technically started in Tillamook, Oregon and finished in St. Augustine, Florida. And I took lots of breaks to visit family and friends along the way. But if you put all of my riding days together, it took me about three months of riding. But all told, it took me maybe four and a half months total. And was most of that road riding or a mixture of road riding and trail riding? It was all road riding. I did a little bit of bicycle paths, but they were usually paved. I've never ridden a mountain bike before and I'm not experienced with it. And I'm intimidated, like I said, (laughs) because of the steering and balance and maneuvering. Uh, Sometimes I'm not very graceful on my bicycle. And so it's sometimes clipping my shoes into the pedals and staying upright is all I can handle. So I stuck to road riding. So what were you carrying with you? I was carrying all of my camping gear food and water. I need to fill up water really regularly and food too. You're just so hungry when you're doing that much physical activity every day. And I carried repair tools that I didn't know how to use because I was brand new to bicycle touring. And even though I'd ridden bicycles for years, I didn't have the foggiest idea how to work on them. I didn't even know how to change a flat tire when I left. Someone had tried to teach me and I really tried to learn, but I was just so stressed about my upcoming trip at that point that I could not focus. And I just figured I'd learn as I went. I carried things like chain breaker tools and extra spokes, and I never needed any of that. (laughs) In fact, my bicycle was so good to me, I only had two flats on the entire tour. Those are the only two things that ever happened on my bike in 5,000 miles. It was incredible. So what you're saying is you still haven't learned how to use all those tools you were carrying in that case. (laughs) Well, this past year in Hawaii, I was lucky enough to be employed at a bicycle shop, so they taught me a lot. I thought you were going to say I was lucky enough to have to use all those tools because my my bike fell apart, which would not be lucky. (laughs) So you're carrying mostly camping gear, food, and superfluous amount of tools. So does that mean you were primarily camping and were you stopping in designated campsites or were you stopping just anywhere along the side of the road? I usually camped. I think camping is probably my most common form of lodging that I used on that trip. I also stayed with Warm Showers hosts whenever I could. Warm Showers is like the couchsurfing.com of the bicycle world. It's cyclist hosting cyclist. And it's wonderful because they have a lot of tools and experience and they're local people who ride bikes. So they have great information about routes to take. And after spending all day pedaling by myself, I was usually very ready for some social interaction. So I really enjoyed staying with warm showers hosts all across the country. They're definitely more prevalent in urban areas. So I never had to stay in a hotel or anything in a city, but they're harder to find in the rural U.S. for sure. So I would camp in designated campgrounds and I would spend a lot of time planning my week. I'd figure 50 miles to here and then an 85 mile day and then 60 miles to there and I'd try to plan it in between campgrounds. I wanted to be the kind of badass who stealth camps and just pitches her tent anywhere but my experience from having tried that is that I was so nervous at that point in my life about being hurt and being found alone and vulnerable in the dark in a non-campsite that I wouldn't sleep well. And so I would wake up in the morning just haggard, you know, like maybe two hours of sleep. And I felt so badass that I'd survived the night and I camped on my own, but it just wasn't worth it because I just had such a hard time pedaling my bike the next day. So yeah, I gave up on that. I just camped in campgrounds because eight to 10 bucks a night was totally worth the good night of sleep that I got. I was going to ask you specifically that. You just answered the question before I even got to it because that was one of the things I was curious about is if you're facing this phobia and you're worried about violence from men, stealth camping would be terrifying. So it sounds like that was the case. (laughs) (laughs) 
I mean, so gratifying when I woke up alive. I was always just so stoked when the dawn would break and there'd be birds chirping and I'd be like, yes, I did it again. I eluded fate. Yay. But that joy did not overcome the fatigue that I felt the rest of the day. So let's talk about some of the experiences that you had along the way, both positive and negative, because you specifically set out to do this partly for the adventure, but then partly to face a fear. So what happened? that along the way that uh, helped you do that. Yeah, it was a really perfect trip. It's definitely why I'm writing a book about it is because there's parts of the book you'll read and be like, no way did that happen. She's making this up. And that's what it felt like to live through it too, was it felt like somebody was writing my life like a novel. There was foreshadowing and there was character development. and (laughs) It was just amazing. Lots of really good stuff happened to me. And for the most part, you know, 98% of people in this country are kind and generous. And I was the recipient of just so much generosity and hospitality. (laughs) It was great. There were some scary times for sure. And it's important to remember that scary to me is going to be a little bit different than scary to other people, potentially, because I was so sensitive and nervous about men to begin with. So, you know, something as simple as like a cat call, you know, I ride my bicycle past a group of guys at a construction site and they whistle and yell something. To most folks, that's not going to be a huge deal. To me, that was utterly terrifying and would send me into like a two hour panic attack as I'm riding along, wondering if they're going to get in their truck and come after me. So it didn't take much (laughs) to thrill me at that point in my life. (laughs) There were a couple genuinely scary moments and one of them was at a free cyclist campground in Montana, Twin Bridges. It's a wonderful place, and the town erected this little free campsite for cyclists with a shelter and a bike stand and running water because they wanted to encourage cyclists to stay in their town longer because we would spend money at the restaurants and laundromats and things like that. A lot of little towns along these very heavily trafficked bicycle routes have the opportunity to capitalize on bicycle tourism in a big way, which is really exciting. So I took my rest day at this shelter and this crazy looking dude walks up. I'm in the shelter. There's only one door. So I'm inside cutting fruit for my breakfast or something. And this guy shows up at the door and says, Olivia, I'm so glad I found you here. And I just immediately freaked out because why does this guy know my name? You know, I just showed up. And so he proceeds to start trying to convince me that he is a Russian mystic. And no, I have no idea what that means. But wait, and that he somehow knows your name? (laughs) (laughs) He has supernatural powers. Okay. He knows my name. And I'm just about to lose my shit. I was so, so upset. And I had a knife that I was cutting fruit with but I think it was on the counter behind me and I felt like I didn't want to reach for it because I didn't want things to escalate if they didn't have to which is always tricky when you're in a really scary situation of you know do you go full force and look really intimidating with the danger of escalating the situation or do you try to remain really calm and relaxed with the danger that you're going to look like an easy target so I just stood there and glared at him with like every ounce of anger I had in my body and I swear if looks could kill he would have just been like on the floor bleeding out I was just so mad And I told him to go away and he didn't listen at first and he came a little closer to me and I did the same rage gaze and told him to go away again. And I remember he was trying to tell me, he's like, you're just so beautiful. You're so beautiful and you're so kind and I can see you're a good person. And I was like, I'm not. (laughs) I, I, I feel like if this person was sincerely some sort of psychic mystic and could foresee things about people, he would possibly be wise enough to think of a better way to approach strangers. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> did you ever find out like how he got your name or or who I the hell did. this guy was? I did. It's a wild story. So he did leave after I did like the scary possessed gaze at him. And that felt so good. I just want to say that felt so good that I told someone to go away and they did. That's like huge. When you're traveling alone, it just gives you a really strong feeling every time that happens. It really helped me feel like I was going to be okay out here. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So this Russian mystic character apparently shows up like every day at the bike shelter to say hi. He's just a really lonely soul and he knows that people will be there and they're kind 
kind of a captive audience. So he had showed up the day before, and there had been a different cyclist there who had met me, someone who pedaled a lot faster than I did. And so that guy had gotten drunk and apparently told the Russian mystic fellow, yeah, there's this girl, Olivia, she's riding her bike alone. Isn't that just amazing? She's probably going to be here tomorrow. And the worst part is, the worst part is that this gentleman who pedaled faster than me and got drunk and spilled the beans on my whereabouts was a former cop. He used to be a policeman. <laughs> like, he should have known better. I was so mad. I was so mad. Because one of the ways I kept myself safe was that I didn't give out my route or my information as much as I could. You know, if people were just being friendly and they're like, oh, where are you going next? You know, I'd vaguely say like, oh, to Florida. You know, I wouldn't give them like, oh, I'm going to be on Route 80 and then I'm going to go to Route 42 and then I'm going to be on, you know, you just, you keep yourself safe by having some mystery to your whereabouts. So for someone to expose me like, that I was just so mad at that man. I was so mad. Did did you ever get to take revenge on him? Oh my goodness. Um <laughs> So it's it's just a really good story and it's in my book and you have to read it. But basically, I met this really attractive dirtbag hippie a couple days later and I had a very faithful, wonderful boyfriend at home, but I was so excited about my own growth and what I was learning and who I was becoming that I just felt worlds away from him. And this very attractive hippie was cycling with me and digging in dumpsters and wearing tie dye. And I was like, wow, maybe this is my kind of guy. He's just so attractive. When really I wasn't that attracted to him, I was attracted to who I was becoming. You know, someone who wasn't afraid of every single man she met. That there could be one who was attractive finally. Hooray. Um, right. And so... I nearly cheated on my boyfriend with this gentleman. I did not. At the last minute, I was like, I just miss my boyfriend. I know what's going on here. But it was a close call. So the gentleman who had gotten drunk and told my whereabouts to the Russian mystic, he caught me with this other cyclist in a grocery store with my hand on his shoulder. And it just, it didn't look good. You know what I mean? It looked like the two of us were hanging out and flirting and having a great time. And so he proceeds to like, police style interrogate <laughs> the guy that I was cycling with <laughs> like mm, Olivia who's your friend here you know just very and so anyway I felt like a piece of poop and so I did not get to get mad at that guy because I felt <laughs> like I was the one who was doing something wrong it's a long story and it's a good book that's all I have to say <laughs> so you were on this trip for roughly three months avoiding stealth camping avoiding mystics as much as possible <laughs> eventually you made your way into Florida and the trip came to an end and something this seminal and long and part of your life suddenly ends. So what was that moment like? What were the next few weeks like where now you're returning to daily life and things are not what they've been like for the last few months? And now you're a different person also. It was really hard. And I've met some other travelers who struggle with this too. There's the letdown of having something so big and so engrossing. It feels like you're losing a friend. You know, there's this grieving period where I was happy, so happy to be back with my boyfriend at that time and so happy to be back with my friends. I just miss them like crazy. But it was really addicting to wake up every morning and have a mission. You know, I'm going to get up today and I'm going to ride my bike east. <laughs> and having a mission that, that's so clear, it just gave my life so much purpose. And so it was a little bit harder to find purpose once I got back to school. I had to wake up every morning and decide that different kinds of things were going to get accomplished, not just the one mission. And also when the trip ended, I spent some time with my family in Florida. And then I ended up taking a train back to Oregon. I could not bring myself to fly. I just couldn't handle the fact that it had taken me four and a half months of pedaling to get to Florida and it would only take me like three hours to get home. I just couldn't <laughs> right, handle right. that. <laughs> so I took a train, which was a five day train ride. So I basically spent a week living on the train, which was a crazy good way to go back to Oregon. Did you get a sleeper car? No, I was dirt bagging it. So I just slept in my seat. Because I've done were... that for 36 hours. And by 36 hours, I was sick of it. So five days it seems like it'd be pretty rough. It was weird. It was weird and so much fun. I just met a lot of other people on the train and I brought my sketchbook and made a lot of art. I think I was fasting also because I was kind of a cheap dirt bag. I didn't buy myself enough food for the trip. So I just decided I wasn't going to eat either. So I was kind of delirious, like with lack of food and lack of movement. And I was just drawing a lot of pictures of memories of the bike trip. 
So I was kind of processing my bike trip on the train with my sketch pad. And while I was on the train headed back to Oregon, I was so worried that the changes in myself weren't going to stick, that the person I'd become through the bike tour wasn't a lasting person. And maybe she was dependent on the bike tour even to exist. And maybe once I went back to Oregon, I'd have all my same symptoms, all my same fears. And I was just really worried about that. Which is a valid concern, right? That's often what happens is we have these big experiences experiences and then we separate ourselves from them and then we slide back into whatever normality is for us. So was that the situation for you or did you find out that it was more lasting than you expected? It was very lasting and the interesting thing is that it's taken years to process the trip. So when I first got back, I was one version of the trip and then a year later I had processed more parts of the trip and you know these big adventures that you take live inside of you. They continue to have a life of their own and they help you through different parts of your life. You know, when a big challenge came up in college, I would draw on strength that I had from my solo adventures. Or, you know, if I was worried that I wasn't good enough to have the job of my dreams, I just remember like, you were good enough to pedal solo across the United States. That's something. So it was definitely lasting and it was the most transformative event of my life. I did the most growth in the shortest amount of time on that bicycle trip. So I got really addicted to bicycling and I've done a few other shorter tours and all of them have been amazing and wonderful. But I haven't felt that need to do another really epic long tour again. I just haven't felt called to put aside, you know, four or five months to spend that much time alone anymore. I feel like a lot of my challenges now are with people. You know, I need to put myself in situations where I am dealing with people and not with myself anymore. (laughs) I've dealt with myself. (laughs) (laughs) You've had enough time with yourself. Now it's time to take time with other people. Are you doing that now? Are you actively joining groups and social groups and things that are either bike related or not related to bikes and some sort of other activity? Um, I'm spending a lot of time with my boyfriend, which is wonderful. He probably appreciates that. Yeah, it's great. This is not the boyfriend that I had when I biked across the country. This is This is a new guy. He's wonderful. And I'm able to love him more than I've ever been able to love anybody because of the growth that I've been doing. When you're afraid of humans, you tend to hold them at arm's length. And so I'm taking different challenges in my life now to let people closer to me and really trust, not necessarily trusting the human, but trusting that whatever is meant to happen is going to happen. And that love is never wasted or scary. You can give all the love in the world and it's not going to hurt you when it ends because it's eternal. So I'm just letting myself get more comfortable in crowds. My boyfriend took me to my first major concert ever and I didn't get scared in the crowd, which was cool. I didn't enjoy how loud the music was. It hurt my ears, but at least I didn't get scared in the crowd. So I'm just challenging myself in little daily ways like that to stick with people and stand by them and be amongst them and not feel judged or scared or, you know, whatever I was feeling before in my life. So what year was it that you said you did your bike trip? I started the bike tour August 1st of 2011. I was 21 years old and I turned 22 on that trip. Okay, so it has been six years or a little more than six years since then. So at what point did you decide you wanted to take that experience and turn it into a book? I wanted it to be a book even before I went. And the more wild, wonderful things happened to me on tour, the more I wanted to write the book. And then after I returned to college, Wild by Cheryl Strayed came out. And I was so in love with her writing style and with her candor because I had read so many women's adventure books before I left on my bike trip. I was trying to get myself in the zone and I wanted to know how other women had handled it. And these books that were written by other female cyclists, I found them super boring. That's my own pickiness. I'm just not a huge fan of a lot of books. I like a few books a lot. (laughs) I tend to be really picky about the style that I look for. And a lot of memoirs were just handling the trip too delicately and too professionally. 
for me. I wanted people to tell me what it was like to get your period on the road. You know, I wanted to hear the real truth about what it was like to be horny and away from your boyfriend and what to do when you meet strangers. Like I wanted a very raw, real account of someone's adventure, not just their external physical adventure, but what was going on inside of them. And Wild by Cheryl Strayed delivered wholeheartedly. I mean, that book is like so graphic and so real and raw about her experiences and what she was struggling with while she was on the trail. And I also like that hiking is a really boring activity to write about. So is bicycling. You're just moving forward and it only works as a vehicle for the real story. Cheryl Strayed's book isn't about hiking. It's about her overcoming the grief of the death of her mother and overcoming her drug use and lack of worth and things like that. Whereas my right, bicycle it's, it's trip the is the just the vehicle for all of those things, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that book came out, and I was so inspired by it, and I thought, "Wow, I'm going to write my book." And so I started writing in 2012, and I couldn't be that honest. I couldn't. I didn't have enough distance from the events, and I was still with that same boyfriend, and I just felt like I couldn't write candidly about what had really been going on. And so I ended up aborting that mission abandoning the project, not writing the book. But I wrote myself an email that said, Olivia, you got to write this book one day when you're ready. Please take it back up. It's super important. And I actually found that email in my inbox the other day. I was really excited by it. So (laughs) yeah, so six years later, I just have enough perspective on who I was, the kinds of growth that were happening for me, what all these people I met really meant to me. And I can be very candid about what was going on during that trip now. Now, I like what you're talking about, about the formality of some of these books and people's reluctance to share the deeper portions of themselves, because it's really easy for those books to basically turn into glorified guidebooks, which of course are going to be less interesting unless you are trying to have the exact same trip they had. And the way that a person is affected by a trip is of course going to be what is more interesting to more people and more apt for more people's lives. So where are you presently with the book at this point? Have you completed it or are you still in the process of writing it? I'm about halfway through writing the chapters. I finished a nonfiction book proposal that I've been pitching to different publishing agents. My goal is pitching to 20 agents before I try some other avenue. And right now I've got three agents down. So I need to pitch to 17 more agents before I'll feel like I've given that a decent shot and maybe need to redo my proposal or get some more feedback or something like that. It's hard to get published. I don't think anybody will tell you it's easy. You can always self-publish, but I really want this book to have the largest audience that it possibly can. And I'm willing to sacrifice profit for that. I really want this book to be as big as it can be. I'm shooting for international bestseller published in 30 languages. (laughs) So that the guy I met from South Korea on my bike trip can read this book and read about himself in it. (laughs) So what's your plan? When are you hoping to have completed it? And and I mean, of course, so many things are going to be outside your control. You're going to spend way more time than you'd like to dealing with trying to get distribution and publishers and all those things, as I'm sure you're aware. But ideally for you, when would you be done and when would this be available to the public? I would love for this book to be published by next January, a year from now. But I don't, I honestly don't know how realistic that is, but that's totally what I'm telling the universe I would like. (laughs) That's what I'm asking for for Christmas this year. I find that when you tell the universe you have a goal, it starts to try to assist you in some way. So hopefully that will be the case here as well. What can people listening to this do to find out more about your book or to help you on your path to completing it and getting it out there? The publishing industry is all about who you know, and I've learned that I don't know anybody. So if any anyone listening has any interest and knows a publishing agent, please let me know. You can contact me on my website at oliviaround.com. You can also read interviews with other female cyclists. There's wonderful stories from different women who have bicycling as part of their lives. You can read excerpts of my book online. You can subscribe to my blog and you'll get a weekly update and I will be posting updates of when the book is coming out and if I found an agent yet and if we found a publisher who wants it. All of those updates are going to be happening in my weekly newsletter. So you can subscribe to my blog at oliviaround.com. Yeah, and mostly just support adventurers in your life and support yourself in having adventures and making space to face your fears 
because the more people who face their fears and learn to love people despite the scary world we live in, the better everything gets for everybody. So it's the most selfish act ends up being the most selfless act. Working on yourself is such a huge boon to everyone around you. I agree. Becoming a better person can only help benefit other people as well as yourself. Mm -hmm. Are there any sample chapters or anything on the website or is it strictly writing about other topics outside of what's going to be in the book? Lots of the blog posts have excerpts of the book in them. There are three sample chapters on the website, one of them about Oregon, one of them about Mississippi, and a third sample chapter that's about Colorado. All three of them are pretty fun. They're all pretty wild. If you don't like the writing style, it's totally fine. There's probably going to be lots of edits between now and the book. So don't give up on me if you hate it. So here's what I propose to people who are listening who have found this to be an interesting topic. I propose they go to your website, look at those sample chapters, and if they like what they have read, contact whatever book publishers they're aware of and say, hey, you should be aware of this book. I would be really interested in purchasing this book should you publish it. That's what I propose people do. That would be divine. That would be wonderful. (laughs) Thank you for that shout out. Um, Also, I'm always trying to garner more interviews with female cyclists. So if any of the listeners out there have a wonderful, badass lady friend that rides a bike regularly in whatever capacity, please let me know. Contact me and send me her information and I want to interview her. And you did say, I I was thinking about perhaps wrapping this up because we covered this one topic so well, but since you've brought this up, I do think we should talk about this a little further. You mentioned earlier that you have become part of an organization that is focusing on women cyclists specifically, right? I would love for there to be an organization that focuses more on women cyclists. So far, I've only found regional ones. And again, that might just be my sad research habits, but I would love for there to be more of a community for female cyclists. And that's what I'm hoping to foster with OliviaRound.com. Okay, so that that's what it was. It was that you were offering to speak to female cyclists and feature them on your website. Mm-hmm. So I do think we should probably go ahead and start wrapping it up. I think we have covered your bike tour and other things quite well. Other than your website, yeah. is there anywhere you would like people to go to keep up with what you're doing? Yep, you can go to my website and click subscribe, and then you'll be on my weekly newsletter list. You can always unsubscribe if you don't like it, but my newsletters are really short and they just give the highlights of the week. Okay. What I like to do at the end of the show is to give you the opportunity to either leave the audience with some sort of final thought or if there's a topic we haven't discussed yet and you want to speak about that or something you'd just like to give people as a piece of advice that you've learned on your way, now's your chance to do that. One of my favorite things about riding bicycles is how vulnerable they make you. I have learned that vulnerability is a double-edged sword, that it makes you look like an easy target, but it also makes people want to protect you more. So being a solo woman on a bicycle means that I have more people looking out for me, as well as more people possibly looking to hurt me. So I found that it actually cancels itself out. I've been really interested in exploring vulnerability and how to be vulnerable and yet strong. And I had an article published last week on the Adventure Cycling website called It Ain't So Bad Being Vulnerable. So you can visit the Adventure Cycling Association website and see that article I wrote on there. Yeah, and I'll make sure in the show notes, I always include show notes on the website. I'll make sure that we have a link directly to that article so people can go read that should they desire to do so. I think we've covered everything. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and deal with uh, my raspy coffee voice. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me on the show, Jason. I really appreciate it. This is my, my first podcast premiere and I'm just delighted. Oh, nice. Well, I hope I didn't let you down too much. (laughs) No, no. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. And I know all of you know what time it is. It is time to go to our website, gogetoutside.com slash podcast, and look for this, episode 63 with Olivia Round, where you will see photographs of her in action and a number of links including a link to oliviaround.org where you may read excerpts from her upcoming book. So take a look at that. 
See if you are a fan and if you desire more. Get the word out. Subscribe to her newsletter and let all of your many, many publishing friends know that you want to see her book published. There is also a link for the article she wrote for the Adventure Cycling Association. So head to the website and check those things out. And while you're there on the internet, as I know all of you listening currently are, Why don't you let us know what you thought about this episode, past episodes, future episodes, or something completely unrelated. Send us a message, go at butcherbirdstudios.com or grab your rotary dial and give us a call at 818-925-0106. There you may leave us a voicemail. And if I haven't asked you to do enough things, how about you run to your podcast purveyor of choice? Rate, review, subscribe, and share this show. It'll do me and everyone involved a great big favor and we will appreciate it for the rest of our fleeting lives this episode of the go get outside podcast was edited by griffin davis it was produced recorded and additional editing was done by me your host jason milligan and as always the go get outside podcast is brought to you by butcher bird studios next time on the show Come back February 16th and hear me speak with Kevin Hyden. One of the goals of this podcast is to get people outdoors and introduce new people to new activities. And Kevin is one of those people who discovered canyoneering two years ago and has fallen fully in love with the sport and the outdoors in general. So come back, hear him talk about how he developed from a newbie to the experienced canyoneer he is now and soak in the excitement that he has for everything outdoors related. February 16th, Kevin Hyden, see you then.